Hi everybody, Ziv Simon here. I'm the creator of Surgical Master, the surgical training for dentists. Welcome to another instant replay, which is a presentation I record immediately after a surgical procedure. I give you a recap, give you some tips and tricks, and also the lessons that I've learned from the case. And I recorded this presentation, uh, especially for a friend of mine who was about to extract uh, tooth number 30 uh, in his practice, and he had some questions for me on how to do it and how to do the bone grafting and how to manage the case. So this is for you, Rabad, and good luck tomorrow with your surgery. I hope this helps you. So in this presentation, I'm going to talk about how to extract a molar with a severe infection and uh, missing buccal plate. How do we handle the extraction, the flap, and uh, the bone grafting, everything that is involved with the case? So what I would encourage you to do is to look very carefully at the radiograph, detect the uh, area of infection. We're looking at an infection involving the mesial root. We are looking at some frocation involvement. And definitely you can expect to have part of the buccal plate missing. So when you are looking at the clinical situation, you can already see some of the swelling. I would encourage you to start by reflecting a full thickness flap starting from the buccal I personally start with a number 15 blade. I start with an intrasulcular incision, and I, I preserve uh, the majority of the tissue. I also repeat the incision with an, an instrument called the Orban knife, uh, which has a sharp end, and that also defines the incision line, makes the flap reflection a little bit easier. So, uh, you know, the choice is yours. You can extract the tooth first, and then reflect the flap, or reflect the flap, and then uh, then uh, extract the tooth. It, it doesn't ma matter too much. Uh, it's your choice, but you definitely need to be able to reflect the flap in full thickness to expose the deficiency on the buccal area. And in this case, like we expected, the buccal plate is practically not there anymore because of the infection, and that corresponds to where the mesial root used to be. So what you need to do is curette the defect uh, very, very well. Spend if, a few good minutes using uh, different sizes of curettes, spoon curettes, and clean out the defect. There's going to be a lot of granulation tissue. You'd like to remove the granuloma from underneath. Make sure that you are in contact with healthy bone. And in terms of your flap reflection, you need to reflect the flap beyond the defect. So you need to you know, make a, a relatively elaborate flap to, to be able to expose it. That will be very helpful in the next steps. So once you extracted the tooth, reflected the full thickness flap, uh, curetted the defect, you'd like to assess the socket. Look at the um, number of walls. Uh, so I'm pointing out to the uh, bone in between the roots. We're able to preserve that. Uh, the lingual bone or the lingual plate is totally intact, so you don't necessarily need to reflect a lingual flap. And we also have part of the buccal bone uh, present, but that's more around the distal root. The, the buccal bone is deficient where the mesial root used to be. So that's very important to assess because when you plan your grafting procedure, you need to consider a membrane in this area to basically contain the bone graft material. So when you look at the socket, the first thing that you do, you debride very, very well. Don't leave anything behind. Use some saline irrigation to flush it out. Uh, count the number of walls. Uh, make sure that uh, you, you're aware which walls are there, which ones are not. And that, that will help you in managing the bone grafting part. And then expose the defect all the way to its margin. You, you want to see good, healthy bone, and that will allow you to place the proper size of membrane. Now, speaking of membrane, one of the problems that I hear from, from dentists is that they uh, cut a little membrane, they put it in the, uh, in the proper place, and as they take it in and out and trim it further and adjust it, the membrane actually gets soaked. It gets hydrated with blood and saliva, and then it becomes very loose and not usable. So what I would recommend, it's a little tri trick, I recommend you create a little template Okay, just a template for the membrane. Once you're ready with the template size, as I'm going to show you how to do it, you will ask your assistant to replicate the template in the actual collagen membrane. It'll save you time. It'll actually save you some money because you won't uh, waste those um, you know, expensive collagen membranes. And the way we create a, a membrane template, 
we will use the inside packaging of the suture. It's made out of uh, basically paper. You, you will use the suture anyhow later on. So you'll take the suture out, you'll use the paper and cut a little template the size that you think is appropriate. And that's something that you, the doctor, will do. And once you know that um, you know, the size is uh, the one that you need, you will hand this template to your assistant and she will cut a collagen membrane in the same shape. So what we're looking at is the template right here. You see it's all bloody and hydrated and loose because I tried it in a couple of times until I got the shape that I wanted. And this shape basically will cover the whole missing buckle plate and a little bit beyond. I gave it to my assistant. Now she's using the actual collagen membrane and she's going to cut or basically replicate the same shape in collagen. What's important to note is that these two materials, they look and feel exactly the same. The only difference is that uh, the top one is collagen, the bottom one is paper. So it's very easy to get confused and heaven forbid if you put some paper inside the socket, that's going to be a tremendous problem. So make sure that you tell your assistant to pay attention which is collagen, which is paper, and hand you the right one. Okay, there's not going to be any way to differentiate between the two. So if you have any doubt, you, you start fresh and you make sure that you have a collagen membrane that you're going to use. So since you reflected the flap uh, in full thickness and you exposed the whole defect, you can now place your collagen membrane to cover the defect and about a millimeter or two beyond, uh, mesial and distal, but also apically, you also like the membrane to be tucked in under the flap to cover the full extent of the defect. Once you have that in place, uh, you know, no need to stabilize it, but you know, kind of hold it with an elevator or with a mirror to make sure it's, uh, it's there as you condense your bone graft material. So what you'll do, you'll use bone, uh, a bone carrier or a little, um, uh, you know, a, uh, an elevator, uh, you'll place the bone particles. In this case, we're looking at an allograft. That's uh, human bone from a bone bank. You'll place it inside the socket. You'll condense it in uh, with moderate force, more in the distal root, less on the mesial root, because we know that this bone here is missing. If you put too much pressure, it'll actually push the membrane a little bit too much. Uh, so you condense the bone in, and then you have the choice to place something on the occlusal surface. Um, you know, you can start with a collagen plug. In, in my particular situation, I use uh, the patient's own blood to create what we call platelet-rich fibrin, which is a type of, um, uh, you know, biologic solution for the uh, extraction socket. So we create those biologic plugs and that, that goes on top of it. But there's no problem using uh, you know, coll a collagen sponge or, as I mentioned, a collagen plug right on top of it. You need some type of, um, you know, sealing to the socket. The next step is to place a couple of sutures. Uh, typically, we go with uh, an X suture that uh, basically approximates to some extent the buccal flap and the lingual tissue. And that's basically to create stability. We're not aiming for primary closure. That's actually not recommended. It actually will, will be a bad thing to do because what we want to see in the next few weeks, we want to see this area actually filling in with attached and keratinized tissue. Now, if you uh, work really hard to mobilize the flap and close this tissue primarily, maybe with vertical releasing incisions, you will actually compromise the site. So uh, the best results are if you leave it for secondary intention healing. So the suture material is using GUT uh, 4.0 in this case and using some X sutures and interrupted. And, uh, you know, the key is really to make sure that the flap is 100% stable, that the bleeding is under control. And what you'll notice in the next few weeks, up to three, four weeks in this particular case, is that the, this tissue will slowly migrate in and you get uh, complete closure. Now, you will look at the site in about three months, maybe four months in this case, to assess for an implant. So when you're missing a buccal plate, especially for those molars with big infections, one of the key things is to debride the socket very well. Don't leave anything behind. Uh, irrigate with saline. Make sure there's no debris in the socket. And a good flap reflection, a full thickness to expose the defect, and not just the defect, but the healthy margins of bone to make sure that there is uh, a good place to place the membrane. And, and I showed you a technique where I create a template and then my assistant uh, replicates it in the actual collagen membrane that is being 
place. And again, another tip, don't aim for primary closure. It's not necessary, actually not recommended. You'll get better results, better tissue, and better healing if you leave it just the way it is. Okay, so I hope this was helpful to you in managing an extraction of a molar with a big infection and a you know, lar large part of the buckle plate that is missing. Uh, I hope my friend Rawad will, will do great tomorrow with this procedure. I know he will. He's a fantastic surgeon. So good luck. If you are interested in more information on these types of procedures and others, uh, visit me at surgicalmaster.com, and I look forward to working with you in the future.